All right, if you want to take your Bibles again this morning and hold them up like this and just let it fall open, it should go right to 1 Peter by now. 1 Peter chapter 1. And we've gotten down to verses 13 through 16. We've been talking about God's call to us for holiness in our lives. We spent several weeks looking at that. And so we're going to hopefully finish up this passage this morning. But in looking at this passage, we had an introduction to what holiness was several weeks ago. And we see that by looking at the character of God. And it's his perfection in all of his attributes that is what is the model for us to be working toward. We can't make ourselves holy. It is the Holy Spirit who does his work in us to make us holy. And when we look at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, it talks about love and joy and peace and long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. All of those are character traits or things in our life that we can't manufacture. They are the work of the Holy Spirit. But it is our job, as Peter points out here, to respond to that work of God's leading by His Spirit in obedience. And as we obey God, then God continues to make us holy, to continue to make us into the image of Jesus Christ. And that's the goal. As as Paul shares with us in Philippians 3, he says, that's the real goal for that high prize, that calling in God of Christ, in Christ Jesus. So that's what we're working toward. And over the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at this passage and picking out obstacles that get in our way of pursuing that holiness that God has called us to. The first one we saw is apathy, just don't care. We say say we're Christians, but we don't care what God has called us to. We're going to live our own lives. That will obviously keep us from this growth in holiness. And then the second one we saw last week is ignorance. Ignorance specifically of God's word and God's will. And if we don't have God's word in our hearts, we don't know what God's word says, then we're not going to know what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do and what we should become. So ignorance is that second obstacle. And the third one this morning that we're going to look at is lust. So we're going to start by reading this passage again, starting at verse 13, and then we're going to focus on this third obstacle of lust that keeps us from becoming holy as God has called us to be holy. So starting at verse 13, the Bible says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Let's take a minute and pray before our message this morning. Again, Father, we thank you that you've given us your word. We have it with us. We have it revealed to us from your spirit through the people that you've chosen as your instruments. But Lord, we know that it's absolute truth because it gives us your thoughts. It gives us your opinions. It tells us what you want from us and what your expectations are. And so, Lord, as we just delve into your word this morning, as we submerse ourselves into what you want to teach us today, I pray that you would just give us guidance. I pray that you would open our minds, give us understanding, help us to be ready to hear and to pay attention and to listen and do as you have told us. And so, Father, may your spirit do his work in each one of us. Lord, as your speaker, I cannot do this on my own, and so I need your help. And so I submit myself to you. Fill me with your spirit, I pray. Give me power, give me wisdom, give me the words to say so that your truth may be proclaimed today and you might receive all the glory during this time. We thank you again for what you're going to do and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. As we come back to 1 Peter here in verse verses 13 through 16, again, I just want to point out the focus that Peter makes on this call to holiness. He says in the first 12 verses how great a salvation we have in Jesus Christ. It's secured in him. God's power takes care of it for us. We don't have to do anything to keep ourselves in God's hand. He does all that work. 
And because it's such a great salvation, then with that blessing comes a great responsibility, and that great responsibility is to live in holiness, as God has called us to be holy. And I, meant, I mentioned, again, the obstacles to that. Apathy, ignorance, and as we get to the third one here in verse 14, lust, then we see how all of them are actually connected. Apathy, if we don't really care, then we're not going to do the work that's necessary to search out God's will, to search out and study God's word. So that leads to ignorance on our part. And ignorance, Paul or Peter says here in verse 14, ignorance is what leads us to live in the only thing we have left, instead of God's truth guiding us, then we go back to the default. And the default that we are led by before we're saved and without the truth of God's word is our lust. And so we're going to look at that this morning, and I want to start by explaining, when we, when we use the word lust, many of our minds go directly to immorality, which it does describe as our lust that leads us into sexual immorality. And that is included in this, but it's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more to lust as far as what Peter is talking about here than just uh, being tempted and falling into immorality, okay? I want to define this word lust that Peter uses here, and it's used many other places in Scripture, but in the Greek, this word is epithemia, and it means our de desires and our cravings. So it's not just a sexual desire. This can be any desire or craving that we have. But within the context, what it means is an uncontrolled desire or one that drives us. It refers to our physical desires, our physical cravings. Now, we all have physical desires that are built into our body. God made us with these desires. We hunger, we thirst, there is a need for intimacy, there is a need for belonging and acceptance, there's a need for fellowship, okay? There's um, lots of physical needs that are just inherent because we are human beings, and that's the way God has made us. But there's three types of lusts that First John points out for us, and these are the uncontrolled lusts, or the physical lusts from our body that are uncontrolled or that drive us instead of being driven by the word of God. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, John says this, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world." And he says, and the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So John equates these lusts that draw us into sin with the world, the things that are in the world. Okay, And he starts by saying, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And that means not just the material things, but it means the philosophy, the thinking process, the entertainment, all of the things that would define an unsafe person, not in faith, living according to their own mind, their own thinking, and their own lusts. John says, those are the things that we'll call the world. The opposite of that would be walking in the Spirit. And Paul points that in Ephesians. But in John or 1 John 2, we have these three lusts. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, and he connects them all to the world or this human physical existence. So when Peter is talking about being driven by our lusts and living in sin in lust, that's the opposite of pursuing holiness, then it's connected to the things in the world, to this physical life. Now, we'll define them this way. Here's these three, the lust of the flesh. And we'll say, these are things that make us feel good. And I'll just use one as an example, hunger. When, you hungry, when you're hungry, or, or as my brother-in-law says, hangry, right? Because you get hungry, and then you get grouchy, and then you get angry, and then it's just this roller coaster, okay? But when you get hungry, that is a physical desire. Your body needs food. God made you that way. But it's when you eat that food, then you feel better. 
And there's lots of different desires of our bodies that are fulfilled by feeling better when we fulfill those desires. Now, God created it that way. But the point is, if they're uncontrolled and those desires drive us to fill, fulfill those desires, then they can become the avenue for sin. So we're not supposed to be controlled by our physical desires. In other words, we're not supposed to be controlled by hunger. So that's the first one, lust of the flesh. The second one is the lust of the eyes, things that look good to us. I'll just use that very simple definition. Things that appeal to our eyes. Now, there are a lot of things in this world that we call beautiful, right? But there are a lot of things which the world calls beautiful that God does not. They are abominations to him. I mean, very quickly, what probably comes to mind is pornography. The world calls that beautiful, to God's abomination. And so the things that may appeal to our physical mind or our physical eyes and our vision are not always what appeals to God or what he calls beautiful. So that's the lust of the eyes. And then the third one, the pride of life, things that appeal to our pride, okay, to be lifted up, to be looked up to by other people, to feel like I'm a better person or that I have some more value. Okay, there's lots of ways you can define that, but basically it's anything that would appeal to myself, the exaltation of me. That's pride. Let me give you an example. If you go back into Genesis, we have the first man and the first woman in the Garden of Eden. And Eve, when she took the forbidden fruit, the Bible specifically uses these phrases in describing the sin that Eve committed. It says that when she saw the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, she wanted that food to satisfy her hunger. Then it says she, she uh, saw that the fruit was pleasant to the eyes. Now, God did not make that tree an ugly tree, and that fruit was not this rotten, decrepit old fruit. It probably was very beautiful. And so it appealed to her eyes. That's a beautiful fruit. Why, why won't God let us use it or, or eat it? And then it says that she believed it was desirable to make one wise. Now, remember Satan's temptation. He said, did God really say? And then he said, but God knows that if you eat that, that you're going to gain knowledge that only he has, and he doesn't want you to have that. And so he appeals to her pride. And the Bible says she saw it was desirable to make one wise. She would become a better person, more wisdom. But the reality was this. It was not good for food because God had forbidden it. That was the only food that God forbade them to eat the only tree, the only plant that they couldn't eat of. But that's the one she wanted. So it wasn't good for food. It wasn't truly beautiful because it became more desirable to her than a relationship with God. She was willing to sacrifice everything for something that appeared to be beautiful to her. And it didn't make her wise because it revealed the knowledge of evil for the first time to mankind, which is something that God had never intended. God did not want us to understand and experience evil. He made Adam and Eve sinless. He gave them everything that was good. And they experienced his goodness even in his personal fellowship with them. So God's intention wasn't for them to experience evil, and yet she wanted that knowledge above what God had commanded for them. And so she chose to ignore God's truth. And again, here in ignorance... As Peter references here, she acted in her lusts, took what she wanted, and sinned against God. Now, people will make this argument, yeah, but God made us with these desires, right? And so fulfilling them can't be wrong because these bodies are made by God and the desires are built in and God made us that way. Okay, I will admit that. Yes, absolutely. When God made Adam and Eve, he made them just like us as humans, And he gave them the same desires that we have as human beings. But remember this, that God made them perfect. They were without sin. And so those desires were all within the boundaries of what God had intended for them. And there were ways that God had intended for those desires to be fulfilled that would give him glory. 
But when Eve and Adam both stepped outside of those boundaries that God had intended, they brought, up, they brought upon themselves the curse of sin. And so all those desires then became perverted. And so we can't say, well, just because I have this desire, that means God wants me to fulfill it. No, the desires we have are God's desires that he gave us, but they've been perverted by sin. And so now we elevate those desires above what God's desires are for us. And that is what we call lust. Anything that we would desire for ourselves that God never intended for us or outside of his parameters to fulfill that desire. And so over and over in Scripture, we are commanded to mortify the flesh, to kill those desires or set them aside. Because we're not supposed to be controlled, our decisions are not supposed to be made based on those carnal, fleshly desires that are now perverted because of the curse of sin. Let me share with you some of those commands. In Romans chapter 6, verse 12, Paul says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Don't let sin control your body as your body has these lusts. So it's our lust, those physical desires, that push us to sin against God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we are in Christ, then we are no longer controlled by those things. See, that's what we are freed from as we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, because those lusts will cause us to sin. And Galatians 5 tells us that if we're in Christ, they're crucified. Those lusts are set aside. They're, they're considered dead. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt, According to the deceitful lust, see, our lust deceive us into thinking we're doing something good or we have something good when actually it is disobedience against God, just as Eve experienced. Second uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. There's that pure heart of holiness. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9, but they that will be rich fall into a temptation and snare. There's that lust again, to have the things of the world. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Titus chapter 2, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. There's the same word that Peter used. Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And then Peter himself in chapter 4 of this same book, he says that we should no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. So when Peter says these lusts are what drives us off the path of holiness, he says anything that controls your decisions other than understanding the truth of God and the leading of his spirit, it's going to keep us from holiness. So lust is related to ignorance. He makes that point. Look at verse 14 in 1 Peter 1. He says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. In other words, when you don't have the truth, when you're ignorant of God's plan, then you will live in your lust because lust is all that you have to control you. You don't have the truth of God that the Spirit can use. All you have is the physical desires that push you to do the things that you're going to do. Because that's the biggest influence in your life, is your physical desire. This body tells me what I need. This body tells me what I should do. This body tells me what makes me happy. That's the human being. The Bible tells us, no, the body doesn't know because those lusts are deceitful. And that's why we need the truth of God to, to, re, um, to, to, to readjust our direction. So lust is related to ignorance. When we are ignorant of God's truth, then we make our decisions according to what feels good to our bodies, what appeals to our eyes, what makes us feel like we are better people in other people's eyes, in our own eyes, even in God's eyes. If I do this thing, I'll be bet, you know, God will look at me with favor. Okay, that is a lust. 
That is what we call the pride of life. In fact, James chapter 1, James tells us where sin comes from. He says, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. So lust is really kind of the foundation of everything that we do that's sin. That's where it starts. We can't say, oh, well, the devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make you do it. The devil knows that you have physical lust that, if uncontrolled, will take you down the road of sin. And so he comes and he whispers in your ear and he goes, oh, that's really not that bad. If you only do it once, it's not going to be a problem. Nobody's ever going to find out. Or he comes and he says, just like he did to Eve, did God really say that was wrong? And so he appeals to our lust. So when we look at what sin is within the context of lust, lust, we can define sin then generally as anything we choose to do or think or any motivation that we have that is driven by our lust rather than by a desire to obey and glorify God. And Peter says, that's holiness, is when we obey and glorify God. The opposite, that's living according to your lusts in ignorance. But look at verse 15, he says, but, that, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy, how? In all manner of conversation. That means every single part of our life. So nothing in our lives as believers should be motivated or directed or driven by what we feel or what makes us feel good or what we think is good for us or what satisfies our desires even. Because when we live by our lust, that is not living according to holiness. Let me give you an example. Ignorance drives us to think as human beings that the most important things in our life is survival, right? That's the human instinct, survive, the survival instinct, we call it. Animals and human beings have that. We we go into this mode when things start to go wrong or in an emergency or catastrophe, survival mode, I got to survive. Now, every day we're not in this panic mode, but we're still in survival mode as human beings. Because what do you do, hopefully, three times a day to feed your body? You eat food, right? What do you do so you don't get dehydrated? You drink water. So those are important things, right? We seek water. We seek food. What about when it starts to rain? We seek shelter. We're trying to protect and preserve this body, and that's a natural instinct of our body. So commonly, in the common sense arena, we automatically make a priority in our lives those things that would preserve this body and protect this body and make this body more comfortable and experience less pain. And that becomes the motivating factor in our choices. That's common sense. But what did Jesus say? Is that to be our motivating factor? Is that the most important thing in life? Is to preserve this body. Survive at all cost. Make sure I eat. Make sure I drink. Make sure I have shelter. Make sure I'm safe. No, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word of God which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus said, he was the living water, and if we drink of him, we'll never thirst. The Bible tells us the Lord is our shelter. It's his name that is our strong tower. Safety is found in him, and not in our physical strength or buildings that we can build. Jesus said we shouldn't store up treasure on earth, right? We need money to pay the bills. Jesus said, no, it's not about physical money. It's about storing up treasures in heaven, because where your treasure is, there will your heart be. And Jesus said, in order to preserve your life, what must we do? Lay it down. Lose it. Give it. So it's a total 
contradiction in the minds of unbelievers, and even in our minds sometimes, where we get our priorities mixed up because we're living by our lust, our own physical desires, which tell us these things are important. We have to focus on these. You've got to feed yourself. You've got to pay your bills. You've got to get somewhere on time. You've got to have a house. You've got to have this. You've got to have that to preserve this physical life. And Jesus says, no, the physical life is not that important. The spiritual life is important. You're only going to find that in me. And yet we make Jesus kind of a secondary priority or something we just do during the day and add to our schedule. And so our lust would lead us in one direction, focusing on filling those physical desires that we make priorities, while God's truth tells us just the opposite. The real priorities are what is to come. The, the, the spiritual life we have in Jesus Christ. And Peter says that in this chapter. Look at verse 13 again. Where are we supposed to fix our hope? In the things that we have? In the physical food? In the physical drink? In the physical house? In the physical wealth? No, he says, fix your hope at the end of verse 13 to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in what we have in this world. Our hope is not even in preserving this body. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and the promises that he's given us and the eternal life that awaits us. Because if we spend all our time focusing on fulfilling these physical desires now, we miss the important priorities that God says, these supersede everything else. And if you don't put the kingdom of God first, you're going to lose everything. So it's our physical lusts and desires that distract us from what's truly important. Peter says, if we live by them, we live in ignorance. Ignorant of what's really important. Ignorant of God's truth. And when we're living in ignorance, according to our lusts, we're about as far from holiness as we can get. Now, I'm going to show you the extent of where our lusts will lead us very quickly. Because when we li live according to our lusts, it's not a one-time thing. It becomes a pattern. When we give in and say, okay, my body, my physical feelings, how I feel, what makes me feel good and pleasurable, those are the important things. But, but I'm just going to do it for now. Just, just this once. How many times did Eve sin before she was completely fallen? Once. Okay? And so our lusts are not just a, a one-time adventure over the line. Our lusts lead us to a slippery slope that take us farther and farther down because when we're willing to go there once, then we're, it's much easier to go back there again and again and again. And then those lusts become the uncontrolled lusts that Peter's talking about that drive us in everything we do in our lives. Where will you end up? Romans 1 gives us one example or one result of that. Extreme immorality and homosexuality. And I'm going to contradict the culture, but people don't just wake up and say, I'm going to engage in immorality. I'm going to engage in homosexuality. Okay, They make a conscious decision to disobey what God has ingrained in us that we know is right and wrong. And the Bible tells us that in making that decision, they sear their conscience. And every time they do it, it's like pushing the Holy Spirit farther and farther away until they're absolutely hardened against anything that God wants to tell them. Romans 1 says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own heart, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. There's that immorality. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, that's not talking about worshiping idols, but it is talking about idolatry because then we make our bodies our idol, our God. That's what controls us. And when he, this happens, he goes on, for this cause, God gave them up to vile affections, for even their woman did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of that error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And so one step into immorality 
And this is where it ends up. And God says, okay, I'm going to let you go there. I'm going to let you go down that slide, and it's going to get so severe, so fast, you won't even know what hit you. And it's not because God caused it. It's because that's the natural consequence of sin. Extreme immorality. Here's another result, following false teachers in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I don't like what that preacher at church is preaching because it convicts me. It's too harsh. It, it's convicting and, and condemning things in my life. Who does he to say what's wrong and what's right? I'm going to go find somebody that I like, that preaches the way that fits my chosen lifestyle. And Paul says to Timothy, that's when people fall victim to false teachers because they heap to themselves teachers according to their lust. They say what they want to hear. And there's a lot of them out there. The third one, rebellion against authority. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh, uh, I'm sorry, after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, there's that control of lust, and despise governments. Presumptuous they are, self-willed, and are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Now that defines most of our culture and a whole generation of people today. They are more concerned about their lust and so they rebel against all authority, not just God's. Gluttony and drunkenness is a fourth one. 1 Peter 4.3, For the time past of our life may suffice to us have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness and lusts, in excess of wine, in revelings, which is partying, banquetings, abominable idolatries. Okay, you get the idea. Gluttony, drunkenness, and all that goes with it. That's where people end up. My grandfather used to tell me, if you never take the first drink, you'll never have to worry about the last. Okay, and I thought that was a great rule of my life. Now, I'm not going to condemn all alcohol and say, no, it's forbidden. Okay, it's not forbidden in Scripture. But it can control us. Turmoil and broken relationships, another result of living in our lust. Titus 3.3 for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. When you live in your lust, you want what you want. And sometimes what you want goes against what other people want, and so you end up fighting. In fact, James 4.1 says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? You have a problem with somebody? I guarantee, and I'm not talking 90% or 99%, the Bible says if you have a problem with somebody, 100% of the time it's because somebody is being selfish. End of story. And it's usually it's me. And that's the way we should look at it turmoil, and broken relationships. And then there's one other one, and this one surprised me, actually, but I think it's very relevant and practical. And this is complaining about the restrictions of living a holy life. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. And again, Peter here, sharing in his second epistle, he says, Beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. In other words, he's saying, I'm reminding you about the holiness I've already talked to you about that ye be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us as the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that in there shall come in the last days scoffers walking according to their own lusts. They don't want to hear the truth. And when they hear the truth, they'll complain about it and mock it. Jude says the same thing, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 16. They're, these are murmurers complainers walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. In other words, the NASV puts it this way, these are grumblers finding fault following their own lusts. People who don't care will not know God's word, and they don't care to know God's word about what it says about holiness. Holiness. 
And then when they hear God's word about holiness... They would rather live according to their own desires, and so they complain about what's being taught. That's what the Bible says. Now, because our pursuit of holiness excludes living according to our lust and in our own desires, then as Peter says, every area of our life has to be conformed to God's word and not controlled by what we think or what we feel. Our opinion means nothing. And has no value in the Christian life. What our experience is and what makes us feel good means nothing as far as where we should be going in our Christian life. And Christians will argue, well, there's certain areas of my life that God has not given me specific commandments about. We call them the gray areas. God's left those up to us. Let me answer that statement with these Verses, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. Now in that verse, does God leave out any area of our life that's up to us? No. All thy ways acknowledge him. Psalm, 1, uh, Psalm 10, verse 4. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, that's lust, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. So if we leave God out of any thought, any decision, that's wicked. Jeremiah 10, 23, I know, O Lord, that the steps, I'm sorry, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. In other words, man does not get to choose what we do every day of our lives. Now, we have been given freedom by God. We can choose our own way or we can choose his way. But it's really, I'm going to live in pride and in lust, or I'm going to surrender to God's will for my life. Psalm 37, verses 30 through 31. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. Remember that slippery slope I talked to you about? That'll never happen if we follow God's word. In everything. But there's never anywhere in Scripture, and you'll not find it, you can look for the rest of your life, there's nowhere in Scripture that God tells us these areas of your life are up to you. Go ahead, make your own decisions. All our ways, we are to acknowledge God, to follow his way. And you say, well, what about Christian liberty? Well, when you look at Christian liberty as it's taught in the Bible, Christian liberty is about what we're willing to give up. Not what we're allowed to do and what I can do. Christian liberty is about what we're willing to give up in love for other people. And you can read about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and, verse, and, and, and chapter 10. In Romans 14, Paul goes into a, a lengthy dissertation about Christian liberty. And it's interesting, and without going into all the details because of time, One's about meat offered to idols. One's about celebrating holy days. Another, there's other objects or examples that he uses. And basically, he never in any of those passages says, here's what God commanded. Never. He says, are you doing it to edify other people? Are you doing it because you love God and you love other people? Or are you doing it because it's your right and it makes you feel good and you can? See, if we say, I'm going to do it because I can, that's lust. If we do it or or choose not to do it because God says, love one another, edify one another, defer to one another. We read that this morning in Romans chapter 12. That's living in love. That's living according to the Spirit. Now, why did Paul not appeal to the commands? One of them, again, as I mentioned, eating meat offered to idols, a whole chapter devoted to that very topic. And Paul never says, thou shalt not eat meat offered to idols. Instead, he's, in fact, he starts the chapter in 1 Corinthians 8, and he says, well, those of you who eat meat offered to idols, you know that it doesn't change the meat, that the false idols that it's offered to, they're not really gods, and so nothing changes about it. And then he says, you know that, but knowledge puffeth up. In other words, your knowledge about something causes you to act in pride. Pride. 
not love. And then he goes on for the rest of the chapter and he explains the problems with meat offering, eating meat offered to idols. Never once did he ever reference the fact that several years before he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the Jerusalem council and all the elders of the churches got together and decided as a whole that for the church of God, they should not eat meat offered to idols. Paul never talks about that. Why? Because he doesn't want people to live by the thou shalts and thou shalt nots. He wants people to live by the convicting of the Holy Spirit and by the leading of the Holy Spirit as they start to understand God's word and how it should be applied. And so he appeals to love one another instead of thou shalt not. Now, if we choose to do things in our life because I can, because I'm allowed to, without thought of how it affects other people, that's lust. And that's not holiness. You know why people want to claim that God doesn't care about the gray areas? Because they want to keep doing what pleases them. They love their lust. They live in their lust. And they do it in ignorance of the scriptures, either willfully or just because they've never bothered to study it out, in apathy. And that's exactly what Peter says here in verse 14, that should not define believers who have been given this great gift of salvation. We don't live for ourselves. We don't live to please ourselves or to make ourselves feel good. And so even things that God hasn't given direct commands against, there are lots of principles that need to be applied as we seek the truth in God's word and then ask the Holy Spirit, okay, God, how should I live this out in my relations with other people in all of these areas that there's no direct commands about? God doesn't just say, do what you want, make your own decisions. No, these scriptures apply to everything. Peter said that, all manner of conversation. Let me give you a list. God hasn't given any direct commands about what kind of music we listen to, what kind of clothing we should wear, whether we should drink alcohol. The list goes on and on. You know the gray areas, all the argument areas that people dispute and go back and forth, and everybody has a different opinion. What has God said? That's the question. Well, there is nothing. Well, yeah, there's a whole book full of principles. Because just because there's no thou shalt and thou shalt not doesn't mean God doesn't care. In fact, Jesus condemned the Pharisees because they were so focused on living out the smallest details and the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots, and they tithed even their spices. And Jesus said, okay, you're so concerned about the details, you've missed the entire principle of Scripture. You don't love God, and you don't love other people. So there's lots of principles in the Bible that God has given us to guide us that will control and conform our outward conduct in these areas to the path of holiness. Now, if you, and and I've been here, okay, I've, I've been in places where I've taught, I've heard other preachers teach these principles of holiness, and There are people who will complain about the standards and rules and, oh, you're just being a legalist and all the rest of it. I just read you verses that say those people who complain about holiness, they're the ones living in their lust. Okay? They're not concerned about holiness. Let me give you an example, and I'm going to finish up here in just a minute. Years ago, I preached in another church, and I was preaching a message similar to this, except it was specifically... The message was about using biblical principles to choose music that is glorifying to God. All right, and in that message, I pointed out specific principles that God has given us in Scripture to help us as Christians choose music that will glorify Him. I'm not going to say the right kind of music, because it it all comes down to music that glorifies God. In all you do, give glory to God. I had hardly said amen. Amen. And there were a couple of people in the church that made a beeline to me. And they came up and they're like, you were attacking my music. I was like, I didn't attack any music. I never named any kind of genre. I never named any specific type of music. All I gave you was principles of God's word to help you make good decisions 
in using music or in listening to music that glorifies God. And yet what they heard was I was condemning what they had chosen to do because they knew that they hadn't sought God in that decision. But shoot the messenger, right? They called me a legalist because I was trying to make everybody listen to the kind of music I listened to. I didn't tell them what kind of music I listened to. I gave them principles from God's word about what kind of music or what, what would guide us in making those decisions. What I found usually is that people who call me a legalist because I strive to submit every area of my life to the principles of God's word and make decisions based on that, and because I have more restrictive standards, They'll call me a legalist, and usually those are the people that are trying to force their convictions on me and make me conform to what they want. Now, I'm not lifting myself up here. I'm telling you how we should live by the truth of God's word. And this is not an isolated event. This has happened all through history. When someone strives to submit themselves to the principles of God word, God's word to live in holiness, there will be people that God bring, not God, that Satan brings into their life to criticize, to complain, to try to drag them off course. And just like James 4 says, conflict between people results when lusts become the main factor. I want what I want. This is what I've chosen. Now I've got to go find something in Scripture that will prove it. That's not the way we're supposed to live. The Bible says we are to live in holiness. And Peter says the lusts interfere with that. And the reason you live by your lust is because you're ignorant of what God wants you to do. We are not to be conformed to the lust that defined us before we were saved. Now, do you know how not to be controlled by your lusts? Verse 13, gird up the loins of your mind. Bring in all those loose edges, the loose ends of your thinking that aren't bound up in the truth of God's word. Be sober-minded, serious, focused on what God really wants for you. And hope for the end for the grace that is brought to you at the coming of Jesus Christ. Life is not all about the now. Life is about what is to come. And so the question is, how are we going to live? Galatians 5.16 says, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Do we walk in the spirit in everything? Do we surrender all areas of our life for God to show us what is right? We read this this morning, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, not acceptable to people, not acceptable to your pastor, not acceptable to what you want, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might be able to prove what is good and acceptable and that perfect will of God for you in your Christian walk. Do you know what God's perfect will for you is? Be ye holy as I am holy in all manner of conversation. That's God's will for us. So what's keeping you from fulfilling that will of God? Apathy? Ignorance? Lust? Or maybe the better question or more important question is this. Are you ready to surrender today totally to do God's will? To let your entire life be governed by God's spirit through the principles of his word so that you truly can grow in holiness? That is a question we have to answer every single day. But you have to start somewhere. And Peter says, 
Don't live in lust. Live in truth. Don't be ignorant. Don't be apathetic. Focus your mind on God's word. Let everything be controlled by God's word. And then you will experience that growth and holiness, that progression and that path to what God has called us to. And that's what Paul was talking about, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Is that what we're walking toward? Or are we just doing whatever makes us feel good? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your truth. It's not easy to read and to apply in our lives many times. And this is a tough lesson for us to hear and to live by. All of us are distracted by those things which we love to feel, which we love to hear, which we love to see, we love to experience. And yet that is not what we should let our lives be controlled by. Lord, you've given us that direction. And so help us to be diligent in seeking it out and in seeking your way for us so that we truly can become holy, letting your spirit do his work in us through a knowledge of your truth in the word that you've given us so that you can be glorified in our lives as you really want to. Forgive us for our failure in this. Forgive us for our selfishness, for living in our lust. And Lord, just correct our path so that we're following you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our